watching Digging Deeper. We are season two. I'm your host, Tazine. And with me, I have a special guest, Kafani, who is from, you're from Detroit, right? Yep, D-Town. Actually born in Flint, grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Born in Flint. He spent 15 years. It's great. Yeah, you got like the real chai. Okay, so today's topic is dancing with the divine, the spirituality of dance. But before we jump into the topic, Waalaikumsalam. Uh, my sister's on too. Hi. So before we jump into the topic, I want to talk a little bit about who you are. Mm-hmm. So if you could tell tell the viewers who you are and what got you into dance. Um, uh, my name is Kavadi Ibrahim Hassan Sise. Uh, born in Flint, Michigan. Grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And what actually, surprisingly, dance is what got me into Islam. Um, hmm. Uh, I was I was what you I, I studied young uh, I was real shy what's up for all the nerds I was super nerd comic books and everything when I was young and so uh, um, I was really shy you couldn't say that I was a dancer when I was young I was too shy to even get mm-hmm. into dance it's just that after I got into high school at Cast Tech I took some classes in modern jazz mm-hmm. um, a little ballet um, always wanted to take tap and I never did it and I just had a liking for it and during this age in that time techno music came about and most yeah. people don't realize that techno house and hip hop are kissing cousins yeah. so in that age when those two came out uh, we had battles in the hallway so you know how that was battles uh, in the hallway in the streets and stuff like that yeah. so in cast tech we used to have battles in the hallway and things like that so after going through school and uh, I went to cast tech to get a, a, a with, with, uh, with classes for, for with art and things like that uh-huh. I was elected to a for a pre what do they call that a pre uh, what do they say those classes that you take uh, that will prepare you for college um, our, ours was a I can't forget the name. oh I know what pre- you're talking about College prep type. College prep, yeah. yeah. College prep type classes. And during that time, I went to Wayne State. And going to Wayne State, we had art classes and things like that. Mm-hmm. During that time, I was really preppy, you know, tweed, coat, jacket, and everything. <laughs> uh, by this time, Ooh. I got, uh, got over here. Young Cavani and Young tweed. Young Cavani and Tweed, <laughs> coat, jacket, shorts. Uh, prerequisite. And like, Your wife said prerequisite. Yeah, prerequisite. You, you got go. it. Thank you. And so I would leave there and go to the student center building. When I went to the student center building, you know, uh, a lot of guys were, were they were even more nerdy than me when I was in art <laughs> class. And I was a really good artist. So everybody was like, you know how it's a kind of competition yeah. thing. I would get tired, so I would go over there. And when I went over there to the game room down in the basement, um, I would just go into the game room, eat, and just look. And there was a guy, uh, who was a hustler? His name was Hasi. Hmm. So, you know, he's, I, was, I was like, okay, this is just, just, just a guy who's hustling. He did whatever he did. They played pool and everything. I would yeah. see him around. And not knowing that this guy, Hasi, was named Hassan. Mm. And so when, uh, uh, during that time, I really didn't pay much attention to him. Like, in that time, there were two different types of people. There were college, I mean, there were people who, who were called preps. Uh-huh. And then there were people who were called jits. This uh, is where the jit dance form came yeah. from. So he was always with Carhartt's on. He was always with Dickie out with Levi's and everything. And I'm this real preppy guy. You know, I'm coming to class with bow ties on and everything. I went to cast. We were real, like, preppy and things like that. So we never really got connected. connected. Yeah. So during that time, uh, after I got into, I got into college, uh, right before Center Creative Studies, they had a summer program called Festival. At this program, uh, I almost didn't get to it because my father was like, son, you got to do something this mu- th- this summer, you know, because I always hustled and made my money. Mm-hmm. He was like, you got to do something. So I went to this one office down off Holden, and when I got in, I was like, man, I'm going to be walking around Palmer Park all summer. <laughs> and it was, in a sorry, quote, unquote, there was a gay guy that I had seen before. I was like, man, please don't let me get in this guy. I'm not hating. But when I got in this line, in line, he was like, oh, don't I know you? And I was kind of acting awkward. He was, I was like, don't you dance or something? I was like, yeah, I do dance sometimes. He said, you know what? You don't need to clean up this summer. He said, I got the perfect program for you. 
It's wow. called Festival. It's an art program. He said, do you draw? I said, yeah. Do you want to do art? Do you want to model? Do you want to do these? I was like, yeah, wow. cool. So he signed me up for the program. The festival program was at Northwest Tech. I mean, it was at Northwestern. So when I went there and everything, you have to go into an auditorium and you have to audition to get in this program. Mm. So I brought my portfolio. I'm dragging around and I sit down and I sit down in this auditorium. I'm the preppiest guy in there. I got on the, I, I got on the, um, uh, Izod shirt, Izod tie, Izod shorts, Izod <laughs> socks, and some Deodoras, oh, and, and some Deodoras. You were basically so, the brand I mean, ambassador, I mean, yeah, is what you were. <laughs> with the Biking cap flipped up. I sit down, I hear somebody go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your wife said, he was a prep for sure. Yeah, sure. And then all of a sudden, somebody's like, Theo! I was like, I know no one in here knows me. I hear this ringing again, and I look around, and it's the guy, Hassan. It's Hassan. Wow. That we okay, never really yeah. talked to. He said, come back up here. We've been a problem. We talked for a little while. We wound up being in the modeling school type program. So we're modeling and stuff like that. i never forget a Heavy D song. We did it, did it, did We got our own thing. It came <laughs> on. So everybody started dancing. And their circle came out. And me and him wound up battling each other. And everybody was like, yo, wow. you all can dance. You all should like dance together. So in the program, they would have people come from. So I wound up mm-hmm. dancing with them. To make a long story short, I went to his house. His name was Hassan Manusi, his father, and I can um, never, uh, I bless him and raise him, and his father, Sundi Adam Manusi, who was initial uh, Baba to me and learning everything, mm-hmm. who was a well-known musician all over uh, Detroit and the world. I went by their house. We we're going to make a routine, and when we got to make the routine, we were making the routine and everything, and, uh, right, and it was in the afternoon, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they said, hold on, we got to make Salah. I was like, wow. what is Salat? Mm-hmm. And so Hassan, he went to go call a garden. Oh, wow. Tears almost come my eyes out. And when he called a garden, it crushed me. Like, I was like, why am I, why am I crying? I don't know what he's saying. Mm-hmm. And so when they, and, uh, and I was searching. I was reading a book on compared to religions. I was searching for a religion. I was about to go into Buddhism or Taoism because wow. I was a staunch Lutheran Christian, mm-hmm. the acolyte boy who likes everything. And so when he made Salat, I was like, wow. I said, if I ever saw a prayer that I could really feel, I want to do it. And so wow. it was through that and us getting together and performing and dancing. And so to make a long story short, a year later, right uh, a few days before my birthday, I took Shahada at Kass Masjid. No. And I was literally, it got to the point I was coming to the mosque so much, they was like, brother, you better take Shahada. Why are you coming to Juma if you're not going? You know how it gets. It, I got to that one point, and as a Muslim who's coming to Islam, you got to get past that wall. Yeah. And so on the Juma, it just happened on that Juma. When they talked about it, the imam spoke about what if you died in sin, or what if you left this earth without finding your whole truth. And so I, it really blew, blew me away. I was like, I wanted to wait until my birthday to take it, which was that Wednesday. It was Friday. I was like, what if I die before, before that. that? And I knew this was the truth, and so I took Shahada. Wow, and then so after cool. that, me and Hassan, we became performers. We're in the city. We traveled all over the world. We did the Apollo. Uh, we went all over Europe, and, um, and here I am today. What an amazing story. Mm-hmm. And the, the connection between dance bringing you to your truth. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But dance brought, it actually brought some people, got kind of get discounted about it, but it really it, it really yeah. brought me to the heart because I met a Muslim who was a dancer and his father and with my initial, and actually it even led me to the Tariqa because I took Shahada and two months after that, Hassan was a part of the Tariqa. He took me to Wazifa and I took the Wazifa after that. And then wow. two years after that, I went to Senegal, West Africa to study. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like the same thing happens with musicians who are into jazz. Mm-hmm. Because all the older cats who are jazz musicians, mm-hmm. most of them are Muslim. Oh, yeah. And you study Coltrane, then you're like, okay, oh. there you go. Mm-hmm. It opens doors for you. Mm-hmm. My father actually, my name uh, for being a uh, confining was named Thelonious. My father mm-hmm. loved Thelonious Monk as a musician. And so my father, I grew up listening to jazz so much that when I got old enough to take his reel to reel and flip it by myself and press the button, you know, I thought I had really done. Yeah. So my father would literally play 12 hours one way and twice, so it was 24 hours, like always at the house. So I, I grew up listening to Thelonious Monk, Coltrane, Cannonball, all, all, all of these musicians. So now 
but until I knew the names, I only knew all the songs. So I would hear the songs, I would start humming them. They would, some other people were like, how do you know this song? I was like, well, like my father, he showed me this way. Yeah. And, and it was beautiful. I met Thelonious Monk's son at the African American Museum. Oh, yeah, he played. And, Yep, he there played that, and they, 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 they had, they had a, and I, and my moniker for poetry is the loneliest monk. So, mm. so that's that's what that's that's what. That's oh, how that's nice. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kevin. Oh, to Sleem's on too. So I like him. <laughs> Welcome everyone. So you you got into dance. What kind of dance did you get into? What did you study dance? Mm -hmm. Did you what kind of how did you study it? Mm -hmm. And what what type of dance did you? That's a really good too. question. It's something I talk to a lot of dancers now, and I've been getting off into. I studied some modern and jazz, modern and jazz. I um, and I was blessed being in um, the festival program. One of the directors of dance was Clifford Fierce, and he was a master of Dunham technique. So I was able to study uh, with him for a while at that. But the the, the changing point for me when I was performing and perfecting what you will call a uh, house dance mm -hmm. or house music dance and things like that at a great club for those who know called the Music Institute. Woo -woo, the first <laughs> techno club in the United States, music. the Music Institute. Check it out. It was That's where Derek May and all of them first played. And so when I got into this and that whole process is that at the very same time, I met my Baba, Baba Ali Abdullah, Who's, who lived in Senegal, West Africa for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I wound up living for 15 years. And so when I started studying um, West African Congolese dance and everything with him, everything changed because mm -hmm. you know everything was, was, was directly on point. You had to be on beat. Mm -hmm. It was by live drums. And I studied the Konkon, I studied Dunumba and these things. When I started to learn African dance and all the other dance forms and even the street dance where I have, um, they, they, they became something else and then it got mm -hmm. to a point where literally even now I can't dance off beat if I do I feel like something's, something's wrong mm -hmm. and so therefore when I see house dancers and people now dancers doing it one two three you can see them counting the beats and doing it it might look good but if I can see you counting beats and if it's off beat in house mm -hmm. I say you're not in the house you've stepped out of the house and ah. if you step out of the house wow. then you're somewhere else mm -hmm. that's yeah, I mm -hmm. mean that's that is a reflection of unity mm -hmm. then between you and the drum beat. What really started to freak me out was after that and learning Arabic and things. And my African dance teacher, he started to teach us a form in which we used the huruf. So people might see me shuffling my feet, but there's a shuffle I have where I'm spelling Allah. Wow. Or a shuffle that I have where I'm spelling, so you're spelling Mah Muhammad with your with feet. My, with my feet. Wow. Or, and sometimes I'll spell Muhammad and then tap my feet in between the memes or jump in between the ha and the wow. dogs or things like that. So when my Islam actually became incorporated into my movement and things like that, wow. it, all, it all, it became more elevated then too. That's a whole nother uh, level. That's... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, guess, so now, you guys, know, now you guys know. Now you guys know my <laughs> secret. People think I'm just moving, and they, I'm like spelling Muhammad or Allah. Because my whole thing was, if I continue to dance, I had to remember Allah and the Prophet while doing it. Just like you, I know when you're doing your music, yeah. there has to be a link. Yeah. There was one musician came called James Blood Omar. You all may have heard oh, yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, yeah, I yeah. met him when I was in wow. Senegal, West Africa. Wow. And when he, yeah, 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 he was one of the top of Sheikh Hassan, Sheikh Hassan sister that did our anthem. And his wife Aisha Fatima, and he came to Sheikh Hassan, and he was playing and everything. And then he said he had came into a euphoria movement. What he had started doing was playing the surahs of Quran by guitar. Mm. Ah, okay. So he had played Fatiha for oh. Sheikh Hassan's daughter. He said, "No, that's Fatiha," mm. and he would play different grooves or different ayat, mm. yeah, in different forms of slowing or speeding them down, mm. and that changed his whole music, music form. So I was wow. like, "Wow!" So literally. If I, I realized if I was going to still doing it and if this dance was going to be the divine, it had to be linked up with my Lord and my Prophet Muhammad wow. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, like huh. yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Blood, blood Omar, yeah, he's phenomenal. And he's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is really phenomenal. Yesterday we had a friend of ours who, um, he's a cellist, and so mm -hmm. he's going to be on the next project with us. Mm -hmm. And he came from a Buddhist tradition. Wow. And mm -hmm. he was talking about how... Is that the guy that place with you all or is oh, another he's one? new we, he's new yeah uh, uh -huh. so the next project that we're doing he'll be on that one mm -hmm. but he was talking about how 
with playing the instrument, the most important thing was the breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. And to do breathing, he used to do like an hour of breathing or maybe an hour or two hours of breathing every single day so that wow. he was one with his instrument wow. as he's playing. I, you know, I actually got into that with my, my dancing. It's a lot goes on with breathing with my dance and movement and actually staying linked to a song that I've never heard. Mm. So actually, I don't dance to music. Music dances through me. I really don't know how to explain it other than and then that's what that's what really happens, yeah. especially when you get a kinship. After learning African music and stuff like that, you can only find a kinship with, uh, with, with, with music itself, yeah. And drums are so spiritual in and of themselves because mm -hmm. you you feel that in your soul. And if you're mm -hmm. dancing and you're connecting with those drums, that's mm -hmm. like a whole different level. Mm -hmm. Though I took one class, you know how at the African World Fest, they always have those um, mm -hmm. dance classes. Mm -hmm. And I took one of them and I was so off because she was like, listen for this beat. Mm -hmm. There was like a specific pattern that you had to listen for. Mm -hmm. And then you would do a shift. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, because it was so new to me, it took me mm -hmm. a while to just listen to it. Mm -hmm. So was, is that something... When you, when you start dancing or when you are listening to something, do you have to feel yourself completely immersed in it? Do you get lost in it? Is there a process of you feeling that beat? You know, for me to dance, um, it's funny. I have a symbiotic relationship with most of the DJs in Detroit. Um, being a performer with um, Kevin Mastery Sanderson and being in the studio with people like Shea Damier, uh, uh, with people like uh, Derek May. Um, it was funny, Derek May used to come to me in Hassan, Long Studio Lao and he would play something for us. And when he would play it for us, he would let us listen to the music. And so when we would listen to it and everything, the reason why we got cool with him is because if something really felt good to us, we would mm -hmm. tell him. But if it was whack, we would be like, mm. No, and he was like, "Man, that's why I effing love you guys, man." You said everybody else I give music to, everything I play, they say, "Oh man, that's great, that's great, that's great, that's great." But we would be the only ones that were like honest enough to him yeah. and to really dance with it. And um, um, if 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 the music isn't right, um, I've even there's been some DJs who gotten angry with me and people and musician. If it's not right or if mm -hmm. the blend is off, I will walk. I just stop dancing and walk off the dance floor wow. because I'm not about to hurt myself or be off because they're off. Mm -hmm. And so really, really, um, I feel a real kinship with music. It plays through me and I play through it. Like take for mm -hmm. instance, if a song comes on and I wanna dance on the bass, I'll just dance on the bass. Sometimes I'll dance on the treble. I mm -hmm. dance on just the words. I dance, and I got that from African dance. And African dance, you can isolate whatever yeah. you want to play and it changed all, all my dancing and movements for me. Yeah. So when you talk about African dance, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about those types or something that what stood out to you the most when you transitioned from now you're doing house and now you're actually studying African dance? What, what really stood out to me, and please pray for me, is something that I want to do, is that all of their dances were connected to something they did in their own society and their lives. Mm. Like they have an agricultural dance. The, the, the blacksmiths have a dance. Mm. Uh, any movements like this that is coming from the archers. Uh, this right here is coming from people who would slow milk. When I went uh. to Mauritania, they had camel dances because they, they, whenever you see people do like this, yeah. that's a camel movement and camel dance. It's all linked to their culture. It is only in America wow. that our dances aren't really linked into a culture. It, 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 even, it's even, like even, everything. even yeah. if I was to do a dance, like I'm on a cell phone, yeah, or like, uh, 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 or like, um, um, I'm riding on a bus, or if we, I really want to create a form that links wow. us to actually what we see in our lives. Because everywhere else in the world, if you go all across Africa to Asia, when you see their dance, it's traced back to something they're doing and in our society most of the dances we do are just catchphrase type dances that don't have anything to do with what we do wow. so we do need tight forms of dance that can be passed through generations that are linked to what we do in our own society even if it's a technological age yeah. agricultural or Same whatever dances. yeah i could see even in detroit something linked to uh, uh because techno music was linked to uh, uh um 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 the whole art, the car oh, yeah. industry and stuff like that. And their music came from them hearing cars and them hearing 
uh, the factory work, <laughs> them hearing the nuts and bolts and everything. And, uh, and, and I have to give a shameless shout out to Juan Atkins because most people don't know at this time, electronic music is trying to dead the true creators of this form called techno. The first one to, inf and, and, uh, to infuse in a techno was Juan Atkins. And when they first started to make techno music, they actually wanted to call it Detroit House. Juan mm. Atkins fought hard for them to call it techno. He said this is technological type music wow. and art, so it's called techno. Therefore, they started to, if you now notice now, they try to cheat people. Now, with Juan Atkins, they try to cheat people, and they uh, have stolen that form, and they call it electro. So after they called it Electro, you started getting different types of derivatives that they made from it, like uh, Garage, Ambiance, and everything, which are really treble-driven instead of bass-driven. Mm. Yeah. And so when they started splitting all of those things up, it's like, and, 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 it deleted, and now it's gotten away from techno, and now you got, like, people who can come on stage and, and wear a mouse head and doesn't have, and, and use a keyboard, I mean, use a, turntable that's hooked up to a laptop instead of really DJing yeah. then you're really robbing the real originators of it like people like Juan mm -hmm. Atkins, Eddie Folks, uh, Derek May, uh, yeah, Kevin yeah, Mastery, yeah, Sonderson, Juan, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean and these people yeah. Eddie because you know you know even Eddie Folks he bought that soulful type house. Shea Dame who came from Chicago he brought another form to it but Kevin Mastery, Sanderson he went out and that, and like the song the, the uh, I don't know if you know uh, uh, of Kevin Sanderson's song good life good life good life good yeah, life yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. good life the originator that uh -huh. so we did when they came out and did those things and now you have people who professionalize it like Carl Craig you got U R and you have all these wow. denominal groups here in Detroit because mm -hmm. the second Motown is the techno age yeah, yeah. but now they're like selling it for popples and now you can see uh, a lot of European artists uh -huh. who really don't have any talent who really can't DJ well yeah. quote unquote doing these huge yeah, yeah. Uh, who, yeah. laptop concerts and, and that was a that was a big fight wow. between the DJs now because in Detroit if you can't spin with spin with vinyl uh, the you're not a you're not you're not a DJ Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vinyl to that digital so called it was a help and a hindrance too. Okay. Because like take for instance the DJs were traveling but then they were paying as much money just to bring all these records as they were yeah, getting paid. Yeah. So when it went to a digital age of C D at first they couldn't they didn't have a way to do it and then yeah. they created a form to do it and now it's going from C D to mp3 like yeah, these people can yeah. they don't even have they they just got a few 64 gig mp3s and plug them in and they're not really blending they're letting the computer blend it for them it's artificial and everything and they really don't know it's all pre-played and everything so it, so the art is being robbed uh, by the real people like michael huckabee who can really spin who can blend a song forward and backwards and who has audio files on on the internet or people like Norm Talley, we got Delano Smith, we got all these musicians and stuff who are really phenomenal. We're really spoiled in Detroit, you know, and and and, and uh, that we have this many. And um, but um, uh, um, at least we can trace it back to Juan Atkins, who is really wow. he's the godfather of techno music. Yeah. So if people wanted to hear original mm -hmm. techno music, mm -hmm. where should they go in Detroit? If you want to hear some original techno with actual home, vinyls. Well, actually, vinyls, surprisingly, a small little spot in Corktown called Motor City Wine, MCW. Uh, yeah. Motor yeah. City Wine, you got TV Lounge. Mm -hmm. um, also, you have uh, Bosco's, uh, on, when, on, on, uh, on, on, on Wednesdays in Ferndale, Bruce Bailey and them, and they invite different DJs. And then you have Second Sundays with Norm Talley, which is phenomenal, at Motor City Wine. And the next week after, which is called Beautiful Sundays by Rick Wilhite. Mm -hmm. And you'll really, really hear some good techno music and some real good banging, stuff like that. Do you have um, places that you go on the regular? Yep, yeah. I try to go to Second Sundays and um, Beautiful Sundays by Norm Talley and, Will, and Rick Wilhite. Uh -huh. So... Let's. Get, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Plug for the name mm -hmm. <laughs> on the connection between dance and the soul, or dance and the spirit. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you think soul and spirit are two different things, that could be like a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. But what what is that connection for you? 
And is that something that was specifically taught to you? You know what's funny about it? Um, I don't think you can be taught to feel music. No. Or taught to feel dancing. It, it's 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 akin to wolf. You would have mm -hmm. to have a sheikh or a guide that yeah. you could watch and be close to and see yeah. how they do things and get encompassed and engrossed mm -hmm. in what they do for you to truly feel it in your own way. And then you're not even supposed to do it the same as them. <coughs> Bless you. You're supposed to make a form, uh, even your own self, and that's what happened happened with me. Um, mm -hmm. My Baba Baba Ali Abdullah, um, uh, who was one of the most phenomenal dancers I ever met. I started dancing with him when he was 55. He's 77 some odd years now. Mm -hmm. He can still dance with me off the uh, dance me off the floor. Possibly, wow. I'm trying to get him here for the African World Festival. But <clears throat> he's written a book, and his whole concept is phenomenal because. He said the true key to all this is vernacular dance. And vernacular dancing is mm -hmm. when you can dance upon the moment. One of the things he wrote about, he said one of the most, he said one of the best vernacular dancers you could ever hear about was um, uh, was Malcolm X, al mm -hmm. Malik Sabas. If you watch the movie, they kind of allude to it. They show him go out on the dance floor and everything. But they said when Malcolm X would step on the dance floor, he was such a phenomenal dancer, people would clear, clear up. And if you couldn't dance, you weren't supposed to be there. That's how I feel when I go on that. Because really, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> dance <coughs> is close to and akin to uh, martial arts. Mm -hmm. I study Tai Chi and MMA, and I want to study um, 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 Shin Yi and Ba Wa Chan. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that key, when you realize that uh, there's a very thin line between what is a true dancer and what is a true martial arts. Wow. artist or or and each one of them when you get to the extremes of them they they have this peaceful freedom to them that links them with mm -hmm. the spirit like the the, the 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 warrior would get to the point in which he would meditate and i think the thing that helped to change and link me more with my dance and that spiritual divine is because i took a time i took time out to make dhikr mm -hmm. and so the more you make dhikr the more you're going to link yourself with existence and the more you link yourself with existence you link yourself with the rhythm. And the more you mm -hmm. link yourself with the rhythm, then that rhythm can come over you. There are five, um, I've taught in my classes before. Uh, uh, there's a book called The Kabayan, and it's something that came through me. You, you'll have five stages of it, and you always see five stages of everything. And you know that every um, all of these things come from silence, from silence to light. We know the light is the admin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hikki Kuna Muhammadiyya. From light, to sound and from sound to vibration and vibration to matter. The best mm -hmm. way I explain it is if you had a storm and right before it comes and you see the lightning bolt and then you hear it and you feel the vibration, that vibration um, that affects your matter. Mm -hmm. Those things and when you're going back and forth with that and all of those five things can be linked to the five salats and the five pillars and everything. But when you find out that link and especially me, I always try to link everything I'm doing with uh, uh, spiritual realities. Mm -hmm. And so when it's linked with spiritual realities, it has meaning for yeah. for me. Other than if, it, if I couldn't find that ending, maybe I wouldn't dance. It would be meaningless yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, when you're mm -hmm. dancing, that's worship. Absolutely. Yes, it right. is worship. It is worship because, I mean, uh, walking is worship. Yeah. Sitting is worship. They say, that's why they say sitting at the foot of a scholar is like a thousand years of worship why not not so much that they're sitting at their feet but because of their actions and words and deeds are worship and if you're there you're pressing you're pressing with mm -hmm. the worshiper i remember one of the stories that was taught to us they said that Sheikh al Haji ibn Yas, when he was in um, he was at mecca and they made salat at the house instead of going to the haram mm -hmm. and the Arab man came to scold him about it and he said why did you not go to the haram it was it was too difficult during that time the house to get there in time and everything and he said, he said, did you know it is better to make salat and blessing with the believer than it is just to go make, 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 just to make sujud at the house. And so he, he bucked up with him and he said, and Sheikh Al-Haji, yes, he asked him a few questions. He said, okay. He said, I want you to go to the Kaaba. And he said, I want you to ask the Kaaba about Allah. I want you to ask the Kaaba about the Prophet. I want you to ask him about, about the book. 
I want you to ask him about, about uh, Hajj. I want to ask him about other five pillars, everything we know in Islam. He mm -hmm. said, would a Kaaba ever answer you? And the Arab looked at him dumbfounded. He said, no. And he said, but this believer that you just played with right now, mm -hmm. I can answer all of those questions. So he said, don't get um, misguided by just wow. the Kaaba itself when you should realize that the Kaaba is in the heart of every believer. Yeah. And every Imam, when he stands, he, was, he represents the Kaaba, and the Kaaba should be, be within us, yeah. I think that's, that's also a problem that's in our times, is people get so focused on what's physically, what's physical representation of something, as opposed to what is that actual thing, what's the deeper meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. And if you get so caught up on the external and you're not looking at the internal, mm -hmm. I feel like you you lose so much meaning uh, yeah, that yeah. you can you could have gotten. Yes. You just you're not gonna see it because mm -hmm. you can't see past the fact that oh the Kaaba is this amazing place we're supposed to pray mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. You can't see past it. Mm -hmm. And I understand it was a blessing that I was able able to go, and it was a blessing to even see it, and it was a blessing to shed tears for it. But I'm happy that. I was able to go to Senegal, West Africa, and to learn what the Kaaba truly is, mm. to be around people who are embodiments of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because it makes no sense to read all books about the history of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you've never seen him embodied in someone. Yeah. And really, every yeah. male and female should be an embodiment of them. So you know, our, our quest is like that. We have a comment here. Malika said. Thank you for introducing the element of tasawwuf to these subjects of art, music, and dance. If you guys don't know, tasawwuf is Sufism. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, what, um, beautiful what said about having a shaykh that will allow the arts uh, to evolve through you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that has helped you a lot? I mean, for me personally, um, being with Naqshbandis, it's been a, such a blessing mm -hmm. because... There's no, there's not this compartmentalization of okay, this is myself in mm. the music scene and this is myself mm -hmm. in the Muslim scene. Those things mm -hmm. are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you feel the same way? Because I know you're part of Tariqa, so mm -hmm. is it is it part of your practice? Do other are other people that are in Tariqa also involved? Mm -hmm. What's good about it is that many, I think, artists and people who are into music and dance and everything are drawn to Tariqa and to Islam even more so than anyone else because they've linked themselves with uh, the owner of all existence. Kaleem is on. And, 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 and the links to all existence. Salaam alaikum out. Got the Kaleem up in here. Um, that they have no choice but to be a part of it. It, it really would have crushed me because when I first became Muslim, I was going to school, school at the Center for Creative Studies. When mm -hmm. I first came to Muslim, it was like, stop, Allah, ah, you're drawing, this yeah. is haram. Yeah. You, you can't draw eyes, you can't do this. Now, I'm in my third year of college. What am I supposed to do? Give up everything I've done mm -hmm. just because, of, oh, you're doing this, y'all, you're doing that. Yeah. It was just it was just beautiful yeah. that when I got to and I was able to speak to my Imam, Imam Salim Joseph, he was able to explain it to me. When I went to Sheikh Hassan Sisa, they did anhu. He was able to explain it to me, especially yeah. when it comes to drawing and pictures and stuff like that. And then it made sense to me later because all of these years when they condemned me about my family's pictures, about my drawing and everything, mm -hmm. when I went to Mecca and I saw pictures as large as, as, as someone's house of, yeah. uh, of different kings and everything, yeah. why are your, your why is your family cool to have a picture yeah. of, especially bigger, big as a building. Mm. And my family, where I might want to mm. have a little photo of my grandmother or something like mm. this, is haram. So it, it made me understand and it made me um, 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 yearn to do more and mm. to get more. It's just only now that I'm perform I'm getting into a more and more teaching and quote unquote a role as imam or sheikh, I've stopped performing as much mm. as I used to because there's certain people who really don't understand. Maybe if I was on layman's terms, but with me doing more and more, yeah. I've stopped some, but I still get my groove in. Don't get me wrong. Now. <laughs> but you know, with videos, um, Shane, yeah. Shane Michelle have three videos out. One by um, one by Disclosure called White Noise, which has yep. 40 million views. I have also Shango by with Wajid, and also another one called King of with Wajid. Actually, Kingdom with Wajid is one of my favorite videos I've ever done. And to my knowledge, I was just talking to another house dancer. I'm the only house dancer that has three 
feature videos with just me dancing in it. So that's a blessing. You guys too. have to look them up. I'll mm -hmm. link them. <laughs> yeah, please link them up. The mm -hmm. last one, would you? That was in one of the. It looked like an abandoned building. Yeah, right? yeah. It was. It was actually a warehouse over off of uh, East Grand Boulevard. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was nice. Oh yeah. Oh, it was. That well, was really well. nice. Um. Halim says, Salam, good bro, and sis. Salam, alaikum, ah, what's up, good bro? Such a great dialogue. Digging deeper knows the right questions to ask, mashallah. <laughs> we try. We try. You know, you, you talk about having um, a sheikh. And let me go back. If anyone doesn't know any of the terms, you can feel free to ask. And if you have questions that you want to ask them, please feel free. Or yeah. something that you want to add to the, to the conversation. Um, so tariqa is a spiritual path, right? And I think it's so true that artists who are artists who actually connect the art with channeling something that's inside of them. Mm -hmm. Like you're not it's not for show. Mm -hmm. It's something that you're taking something that is God given, it's something that's within and you're expressing it, or you're taking something that you feel around you mm -hmm. and it moves you mm -hmm. to to create something. It moves you mm -hmm. to, for instance, it moves you to have a tune that comes to your mind, or mm -hmm. it moves you to have certain dance moves that come about. I think those type of artists are always drawn towards some type of spiritual path, mm -hmm. regardless of what faith tradition it may be, mm -hmm. but some spiritual path because it gives you not only discipline, but it connects you to that which is around you. It connects mm -hmm. you with something that's greater. And I think that having that connection mm -hmm. really helps with ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially in these scenes where mm -hmm. a lot of these, you know, in dance competitions or if you have, you know, DJs or if you have MCs competing or if you have musicians playing, a lot of it can be like just ego driven. Like this is me. Like I created this or I did this or I'm this good. And I think that having a spiritual path humbles you and mm -hmm. it says that, okay, mm -hmm. it's not you. Mm -hmm. It's something that is from mm -hmm. excuse me it's from the divine and it's coming through you mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well one of the most uh, 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 beautiful I said uh, uh, as you said is, is and remember the most high remember Allah much so that you might be successful and people don't really realize that this remembrance isn't just dhikr and you sitting mm -hmm. it's just not reading Quran it's just not studying books if you re recite Quran and you make dhikr and everything, and then you go among, amongst the beast people and you're haughty, and you downgrade them, and you call mm -hmm. everyone a kufar, and you degrade everyone, what's the use of, of, yeah. of saying you're becoming an embodiment of God? Yeah. And a true embodiment of God is when the remembrance comes from you. I always, mm -hmm. I, I was saying to, uh, Allah brought me to an understanding. Take, for instance, the name Mu'min, mm -hmm. which is believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, within the 99 names, he calls himself mu'min, but it's not because he believes in himself. There's no uh, reason whether we believe in him or not. He is as he is. Well, I share him when there's nothing with him. Mm -hmm. But the key is, is that we are mu'min because we believe in him enough that when someone sees you, they believe in Allah. This is a true believer. Ah. Allah never called himself Muslim, mm. but he does call himself mu'min. And he does call himself Mohsen. So until you get to the point that in your practice, in your remembrance of God, whether it be dance or music or what, whether it be a, a lawyer or a doctor, if people can remember a lot through your actions, then you'll become a movement. And this is what some people are missing now. You have to remember a lot much so that you can be successful in true success. And when people are reminded of Allah when they see you, and that's the whole key to mm. tariqah and the whole key to all of our movements and the whole key to Mahit and Aliyah with everything being around us and making yeah. us in remembrance and everything within us being a remembrance. And they say, what is one one of the Sufi masters said? He said that that the human being is a small uh, 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 a small um, 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 composition of the universe and the universe ah. is a huge human being. Or, or, mm. or, or man is a small universe, and the universe is a, is a, is a huge man, a huge, a huge being. So, and that, as before, so yeah. below, as above, so below, as above, so below, within and without, we have to remember, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's no, uh, 
uh, uh, the prophet is no mystery that he used to say that light can light be in front of me and behind me and to the right of me and to the left of me, above me and below me, upon my tongue, within my eyes and everything. These are embodiments of the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to replicate them in all our actions, words and deeds. Let me be quiet. Mm-hmm. No, this is all about you. We're not, <laughs> you have, you're here to talk. <laughs> She said, uh, white noise. Hmm. Stra- oh. oh, you linked up. Oh, that's my wife being Thank a wife you. Being a wifey thing. She put all the links on She real put quick. all Link the me. links. So if you're watching live, there you go. You got Taking all the links. Now. <laughs> you're with the right person. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm with. I am. I am. That artists have, you know, when you find the right person mm-hmm. and you're just in sync mm-hmm. and your artistry is in sync and mm-hmm. how you your vibes, that's just a mm-hmm. whole nother level. Yeah, it is a whole nother level. That should be a topic. Yeah, actually, yeah, that should be yeah. a whole other topic. Tisleem yeah. said, Jules, remember Allah through your actions and you can become a movement. Mm-hmm. Golden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can become it. Or even I say jokingly, you have movement and what your moves meant. Mm. So if your moves mm. have no meaning, if your actions have no meaning, if the deeds have no meaning, then you're not really making moves. You know, there are a lot of people right now who are doing True. things that have no meaning. So, 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 make your movements what your moves meant. Mm-hmm. That's a phrase from one of my poems, y'all. Mm-hmm. You guys should follow him because you. I love the way you play on words. That's all it is. <laughs> moves meant. Mm-hmm. What do your moves? That's so true. Mm-hmm. So, what do your moves mean? Mm-hmm. Words. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And I, and and it's a blessing that we have Arabic and we've learned other languages because one of the most bastard languages in the universe is English. It's very linear. It's very flat. Yeah. It doesn't really have that much meaning. And most people, I hate when I studied in Africa. They say, "What dialect did you learn?" And I always correct them. And I said, "I learned a language. Yeah. English is a dialect mm-hmm. of Latin." Yeah. That's a dialect, mm-hmm. but these are all languages. So we always have to cherish, like like uh, uh, the traditional languages that we all have through Africa and all through Asia, because they are languages and everything, and we can't um, uh, second grade them. But it is funny that we, as musicians and as singers, and especially uh, 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 especially with the African American seeds in America, they've taken this language and made something more out of it. You know, I love the word play. Play. Play? Are you trying to, are you, do you, can you do a play on the word play? A play on the word play? I might be doing, able to do a play on the word play, but I'd rather do, i rather pray and not pray. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. There you go. So can you bring my phone You should charger? pray with people, oh, but don't pray on people. Mm. There you go. Yeah, even though English is linear and uh, doesn't, English doesn't allow for the type of movement that other languages allow. We we've only given it some movement. Actually, it's all the most of all the immigrant people to America have given it movement. Yeah. I remember when people talk about uh uh uh, uh they call it ebonics, and I really hate it because mm-hmm. actually when I study African languages of which I studied Wolof, I studied Hausa, I studied some Yoruba, Fulani. Mm-hmm. and some um, serer. And what I observe with all of these languages I've studied, the TH sound isn't there. So it yeah. made sense that they would say dim, that, yeah. these, yeah. and those. Uh, 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 English language is very uh, linear and, gu- and, and, and it's cut off and guttural. It's how are you? But the average action would say, how are you? It go, it's, it's, it's like their language, it flows together. Yeah. Instead of come by here, Lord, it's come by here, Lord. All of those things, and one of the funniest jokes I've ever seen was someone of the, uh, a curse that we say every day. I had a friend who was Hausa, and I didn't understand what he was saying. Yeah. And one day he came to me, he said, oh, she man. I was like, what? He kept saying it to me, and he said, I'm saying what you Americans say. I was like, what? He was saying, oh, shit, man. But he was saying, oh, she man. He kept saying, oh, she man. And then I would say, how are you fine? But I, it, 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 it was funny. It was deep to me that because of his language, Hausa, he mm-hmm. cannot even think of language as, a, as these separate words. Mm. They were words that are linked together. 
So often when you speak to Africans and their words flow together, you might think it's improper, but it's not improper. It's because yeah. they know language and you just know cut off sounds. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. There's an extension behind the piano. Mm -hmm. um, wow. <laughs> the movement mm -hmm. and the sound in language. Because that's one of the things when I studied Arabic that mm -hmm. really got to me is that... Mm -hmm. Even if you don't understand Arabic, even if you're not Muslim, when you hear the Quran recited from different places, uh -huh. it will trigger something, some feeling in uh -huh. you because there's a flow. Oh, yes. And that's, that amazes me. It's like a dance of these words. When and I so first started to write Arabic, it was that dance. That's what English is linear, but Arabic, when I saw like, wow, I write in these circles and they're going opposite and they're creating a whole nother thing and the dots and everything when i got into writing and everything it opened up a whole nother hemisphere for me mm. it was funny when i got back to america i had to force myself to learn how to read back left to right because i was yeah, always we right yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i was opening up books the wrong way and everything and um even now the way i word things i'm translating it from arabic or from that to arabic and, yeah. it, and it's there but i'm happy it's there because there's one joke, and I think I've told you all before, and I'm asking you all here in Africa and all of the world other than America, they have a joke. They say, what do you call a person who only speaks one language? American. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's the joke, because anywhere else yeah. you go, speaker, we can go to Canada and yeah. they speak more languages. But here, we speak this one language, and we think that uh, uh, when someone else speaks a language, you want to correct them and say, all you need to do is speak English and things like that. Mm. In reality, and in reality, they don't say this to any Europeans. They don't say when somebody's speaking Greek or, or Russian French or, or French or something like that. But if you want to speak uh, 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 Spanish, and if they were in Spain, they wouldn't care. But you see a Mexican speaking Spanish, you want to correct yeah. them. You see somebody Japanese speaking, someone speaking Urdu, someone speaking another, someone speaking Wolof, you want to correct them. Wow. When in reality, uh, uh, these languages are much more rich mm -hmm. than the English language. That's amazing. I'm still stuck on this, the words as dance. Mm -hmm. And your dialect as dance. Because I hate the word Ebonics as well. I feel like it's very... Um, I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I hate it too because, you know, the average... I mean, most of us, when we go to hospitals, I had a, 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 a uncle who was frustrated that he had a very... get a very uh, important operation. And uh, uh, when his particular go uh, doctor came to him, was from Asia, he couldn't understand him. But, mm. you know, they never call it... They never call it... It's like uh, Indianics. They don't call it... Uh, uh, when you're trying to go get some, you know, hair weave or whatever, Koreanics yeah. and yellow, they don't call these things. So we have to remove the stigma yeah. on what, uh, on the way that we perfected this language. Look at some of these singers that we have and what they've done with the English language and how they flipped it. Even yeah. the rappers, what they're doing and how they flipped it. So if you really listen to a, a rapper like Big L or if you listen, listen to Lupe Fiasco mm -hmm. or if you listen to how the people from the South or some people from New York, my rap, or if you ever listen to Black Thought really spitting mm. or most deaf. I was just listening to One World Water the other day and that got me through school in Africa and I was like, wow. I was listening to One World Order of Water uh, what, 15, 20 uh -huh. years ago? And now we're actually doing that. We're going to buy bottles of water. I mean, wow, what, 20 wow. years ago, we, 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 we would have looked at each other stupid talking about we want to go buy a bottle of water. Yeah, now, it's, yeah. now, now it's, you know, it's second, you know, I mean, actually you go buy a bottle of water before you go to a fountain now. That's true. Uh -huh. That is uh -huh. true. We have a bunch of comments. Let's, let's get to these. Pray with people not on people, I mean. Mm -hmm. um, follow Cissé Forever on IG. Mm -hmm. You know what? You just, mm -hmm. you good. Mm -hmm. Keep Kafani Ibrahim Hassan Cissé in your mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. How is African expressions of Sufism and spirituality different than other parts of the world? This is from Halim, West African. Well, it had to be the doctor, yeah. And Kamal is here. Kamal. Kamal. What up, Dr. Kamal? Kamal, you have like the most calm... We were just joking about you earlier, the most calm and pleasing one. You probably you probably just take up hypnotherapy or something. You probably would like <laughs> become a millionaire or something like that. And then whisper words of Allah and praise in their minds. <laughs> he said big love but, and but, respect. But Halim, uh, the difference is, especially being in um being in West Africa and learning other tradition, traditions is uh, 
it's like the difference between the calm before a storm and the lightning and thunder when it's at its and wind at its hardest because uh, mm. in West Africa in the area I was in uh, being in the Turuk or, or the spiritual factories are a part of your every day life uh, yeah. uh, it's nothing for you to be in the market and everybody to drop and start making salat you know it's nothing to see a young child jogging around the streets begging for money and reciting Quran or reciting Dhikr or reciting a Qasid of Sheikh mm -hmm. Ahmadu Bamba or Sheikh Haji Abdullah mm -hmm. It's nothing to see a child who seems like he has nothing with a smile on his face remembering Allah and the Prophet and you know he has everything. Now you have these children here who might think they have everything. They might have their J's, their Jordan. Mm -hmm. They might have all this name brand clothing but their hearts are so decrepit that, that, wow. that they're hanging wow. themselves in the bathroom because they saw it on YouTube. So when I was in this environment and, and from house to house, uh, I remember studying in Quranic school. We would be reciting Quran, and, and, and it was funny to me because uh, I would recite something wrong, and a young kid would look at me like, like wow. you're reciting it wrong. So I have to get corrected by an eight-year-old kid and listen to him while he's reciting. But I remember the best moments was closing in my eyes and reciting Quran. And when everyone was reciting Quran, it was like the buzzing of bees. Mm. And you would just hear my, oh, no, 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 no. Everybody reciting, and the Quranic teacher would be sitting in front of us. And people who were in the far back, he would correct. And people who were right in front of him, he would correct. He could literally zero in on whoever, and he would correct me. He would correct others. And I remember that it would come to sometimes that we would all stop. Now, these moments mystifies me. Like, everybody in the Quran school would stop. And so I asked my Quranic teacher, I said, what, why does that happen? And he said, in their belief and in their understanding, they even had an explanation for that. Mm -hmm. And they said, when that stop happens, they said someone who is righteous has passed. And this is in remembrance of him. And so all of those things, like literally you stopping, reciting, hearing the children recite, when you go outside, when you go to the id, them dhikring the imam to the masjid, them doing the talbiyah, when they come back, as soon as you get back for id al-adha, them taking a leather or some meat out, and you have to sit there. You have to sit there, and you have to eat a piece of the meat in remembrance of the sunnah, to the point where you would see the sheikh slaughtering. And at that time, they would wear their boobas in a way in which when they slaughtered the lamb, the blood would get on that booba, and that was nothing wrong with it. They just take that off, go and move on to the next next booba, and it was just all a link to it. Everything I literally did had a link or had roots back in the tradition of Islam or roots back to spirituality. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it kept me rooted in my soul and not just rooted in just dogmatic actions. That's why you can see some people who go to places and it's rooted in dogmatic actions. And it's so external mm -hmm. that they don't have any heart anymore. They can kill another human being. They can blow themselves up. They can slaughter someone mm -hmm. and things without feeling anything and believing they're right. And that's because they never... Uh, connected with their own souls and they never remembered Allah they only let Allah remember them and so we ask mm -hmm. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, will increase remembrance in our own hearts mm -hmm. what was you were talking about earlier I forget who it was that said the things that you have to know mm -hmm. that tradition is one of them mm -hmm. what were the other ones oh uh, Yusuf uh, uh Dr. Halim can you help me out with that he did one thing on um Remembrance, wasn't it the like, members of the Creator? I think it was members of the Prophet. Arabic. And uh, I think it was, what was it, Dr. Halim? The diagram, um, and then it was remembrance of co culture. The reason some, why I bring it up is because. Uh -huh, something in the last one is uh, lineage. Mm. And you have to remember your, and, and it's Dr. Halim. Can you remember those five he did? In the diagram, when he we did it on here and on, on the healing. creation. Yep, creation. I can't remember. It was creation. Because I bring wow. it up because you're talking about when when you are connected to creation, when you are connected to the creator, and when you are connected to where you are from, mm -hmm. like your traditions, your mm -hmm. lineage. Mm -hmm. You become part of something greater than mm -hmm. yourself. You mm -hmm. become part of a community. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times people, when they turn mm -hmm. 
-hmm. towards these extreme measures or they turn towards these videos on YouTube or whatever it may be, a lot of it is rooted in Mm -hmm. not knowing self Mm -hmm. and feeling lonely because Mm -hmm. you don't understand what you're a part of. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or you think that maybe you're not a part of something that you are a part of. It's in mm-hmm. your blood, but mm-hmm. you're not, you've forgotten it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he said, no, nah, sorry, don't remember. I can't, I, rem- I wish I, I should have took a picture of that, but... Um... Kamal said, I was just talking um, with his, with my daughter. Fitra includes the essence of mm-hmm. blackness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that. Can you can you give a little bit more, Kamal? Yeah, being connected to something. You know, when we when we the deepest thing of it is that the true connection is colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless, it really has no feeling, it has no smell. And in reality, you can't see it. But all of these things are affecting you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the, the holy hadith said you can come to a point in which you can be the eyes from which he sees, mm-hmm. the lips from which he speaks. Now, when, when you get this link to existence, it, uh, it takes you back to the essence. I remember when I was studying um, with one... Um, uh, um, Ghanian Sheikh, his name was Mani Midris, mm. and it was deep. I, I always used to study the stories of Majnoon Walayla, mm-hmm. and he said, but did you really understand them? And I was like, what understand? He said, did you know why he was crazy and why she was Layla? And I said, no, I really didn't explain it to me. He said, Majnoon, he said he was crazy for Layla. He said it wasn't her as a woman. It wasn't her beauty. It wasn't how shapely she was. It wasn't uh, uh, her lineage or anything. He said he was in love with her because her name was Layla. And he said, Allah started out at night. He said, that's why all through Quran is Layla wa Nahar. Oh. And he said, this link to Allah, we're going back to Layla, which is which, in, when, when in reality they say, mm-hmm. it, we will all go back to that night or back to that darkness, which he is, sp- is speaking of in existence. Yeah. And we, then this is what we should be crazy for, a much noon for, um, or be as a much zoo for. So, wow. you know, what'd you say? We got a, as you said just now, universal and particular. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. Adam is the darkness that comes when absorbing all. Mm. Mm-hmm. Everything but. we experience aligns us to our destiny. Mm-hmm. Allah's light. Mm-hmm. We have one more minute for the discussion, and then you, maybe you can share some moves with us. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see me. <laughs> just, That's not just, even big enough just, for me to move. Look, I'll, I'll, no, I'll, I was gonna move it. I was gonna move it, it back. You don't even have no music. I can't even. It's okay. Uh, we'll we'll work something out. But yeah. do you have it? Do you have one minute before it logs us out for the conversation? Do you mm. have any last minute thoughts? Uh, just to wrap this up. My last minute thoughts were: I thank you for digging, for inviting me to dig in deeper, and I'm asking everyone to dig deeper. Dig deeper into yourselves. Mm. Dig deeper into your own thoughts. Dig deeper into uh, how you can connect with your husbands and wives. Dig, dig, dig deeper into how you can connect with your children mm. and then help them to come out of whatever hole they might have dug themselves into. Mm. Because a lot of people are suffering and they've buried themselves and they're dying and they don't know how to get out of their grave. Mm. So don't dig a grave for yourself and don't die before you die. Unless that dying is in the remembrance of Allah.
<laughs> With that, thank you so much for watching Digging Deeper. Thank you so much, Kapani, for being on. Miss you, sis. I'm like, what? You like whatever track is playing. That's Kavani's. <laughs> All right, y'all. With that, that was the whole episode of Digging Deeper. If you missed it, the conversation is on. You can watch it on my story, go on the website, and I'll have all the links for all the stuff that Kapani told us about. We'll see you next week. Peace. D2, digging deeper. D2, D squared. Remember that. Okay? <laughs>